Okay, we are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Anais. I am Gerald. I'm Maya. And I'm Kenechi. On today's show, we're discussing The Circular Ruins by Jorge Luis Borges. How's everyone doing today? Pretty good. Good. Good, good. Now, before we get started, I want to let everybody know that Literary Roadhouse is rated PG for saucy language. I also want to thank everybody for their support. Um, the last couple of weeks, we've gotten a lot of comments, emails, um, tweets, and just people just generally being excited and supportive of the podcast. I really want to thank everybody. If you enjoy this show, do not forget to go to either iTunes or Stitcher and give us a rating. Those ratings really do help us. I also want to let everybody know that on the website, in addition to the show notes, you can find a resource list. We've been gathering a lot of links to websites where you can get free short stories. And so definitely check, take out, take a look at those pages. <laughs> that was horrible. I have to re-record that. <laughs> nice. Be nice. Be nice. Okay. <laughs> I can redo that real quick and then we can cut in later. <laughs> I also want to let everybody know that on the website, in addition to the show notes, you can find a wonderful resource list of places and links to free short stories. Make sure to check out that list. Okay, there we go. Who wants to start with The Circular Ruins? Does anybody have any just initial thoughts off the top of their head about the story? <laughs> what? I I didn't like it. Ah, that, this is going to be good. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I said earlier, I said it's, uh, it's going to be a sparky conversation tonight. Watch out for the grumpy old man. Cause, oh, uh, I love the grumpy old man. Yeah, very <laughs> Anybody grumpy else tonight. not like it? I think I'm undecided. I was kind of confused by the whole thing. I was just kind of like, okay. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I loved it. Um, the first time I read it, it was a very different experience from the second time I read it. I ended up reading it three times, twice on paper and once on audiobook. Um, I picked up the audiobook for like a dollar fifty-two, and it's actually read very wonderfully, and it added a lot to the story. How about you, Anais? How do you feel about it? Um, well, I like the the story overall. Uh, I feel like the language, when I first read it through, I walked away from it feeling like the language was like reading through mud. It moved kind of difficultly. And I think um, part of that, I think, is in the translation, which I didn't realize until I'm reading, the Paris Review has this uh, thing called Object Lessons, where they take like the best short stories that they've published. And over the weekend, I read another Jorge Luis Borges one which was translated by a different translator and it was much more lyrical. So I think part of the issue might be in the translation. And then I went and I read the first two paragraphs of The Circular Ruins in Spanish and indeed it was a lot more musical. So I think part of the issue in the language is just the translation, but that's not, that's not a huge, I mean that's not going to be consoling Gerald. Yeah, I actually yeah. I did quite a bit. Nope. <laughs> I, the first read through the language I did find difficult. That's actually, I ended up um, downloading the PDF to my Kindle and just so people know if you download a PDF to your Kindle the dictionary on the Kindle will work and so when I did that reading it became much easier because I was able to look up the words as I went without having to drop everything and pick up a dictionary I actually enjoyed the language quite a bit and I think part of the problem is it's written in an older literary style which isn't commonly read now, I've read a lot of this type of stuff before, but it was like, it took me like probably like 15 minutes to flip my brain, to flip the switch over so that I could read it in the way it was meant. Um, I agree about it, about the structure of the language sometimes being like mud, but I felt like it added to the story because the story itself was a very muddy story. Like, you know, you're dreaming. And I felt like the language added to that feel. At least for me it did. Yeah, Should I, I do like an overview of what the story actually is for people in the audience who don't feel like reading this? Essentially the story is about a guy, okay, here's spoiler, 
<laughs> spoiler on a how many year old story is this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the story is about a guy who um, goes into a temple and sleeps and dreams into existence a son who he then sends off to another temple and in the end he realizes he himself is a dream as as well. And um, I definitely resonated to this story. I It was funny. I, I felt like it had a lot of Buddhist themes and then I went and did some research. It turned out he read a lot of Buddhist books in his youth. And so I, I definitely picked up on that and it touched on a lot of muddy ideas that I've had in my own head. And so... Like, for me, it definitely worked. What did you hate about it, Gerald? <laughs> Where that a start? Start? This, uh, this, this, first of all, I, I found, I found the, the, the writing was, and I was trying to think of a word for it, but I'll, I'll call it over adjectivized. So in the first, in the first paragraph, we have unanimous night, which, which I thought, oh, it's very, very clever use of words, that. Then we had incessant trees, and I thought, that doesn't really make any sense. Um, <laughs> invincible intent, okay, and then um, numberless villages, and I just thought, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is just, I, I, you know, I, I, like, I like lyrical writing, I, I love, I love, I don't like poetry, but I like, <laughs> prose poetry. I like prose poetry. So, so I I love. You love uh, poetry love... that isn't poetry. <laughs> Basically, yeah. How did you know? Um, no, I, I like I like words that that sing, and 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 yeah, and and further on we have gnostic, which which is not a word I know. Cosmos cosmogeny <laughs> and demiurges. Um, and I, I'm afraid uh, I, I have this principle. If I have to look something up, then it's it's not worth looking up. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the writing. <laughs> but Gnosticism, Gnosticism. I'm dying over here. <laughs> I knew it was going to be one of those discussions. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay. Can I, uh, Gnostic is. Um, isn't that an interpretation of? Um, Christianity that's a bit it's like a religious it's group any, somehow Gnosticism is any sort of secretive mysticism so most religions have a Gnostic thread so you can find like Gnostic groups within Christianity but you can also find kind of Gnostic groups within Judaism too you know it's just and, and I think within Gnosticism uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly Demiurges it's kind of like a spiritual entity one step down from the supreme creator that deals with matter that's yeah, because he uses that when he's talking about people. Yeah, yeah. Gnostic. See, I love my Kindle sometimes. Gnostic, of relating to knowledge, esoteric, mystical knowledge. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I love it when I know my vocabulary. <laughs> Woo! <Okay. laughs> oh man, you cracked me up. You absolutely <laughs> cracked me up. And I know what you mean. You know what's funny? People talk all the time about how new writers always use too many adjectives and they have like passive voice and all this. And I realize what it is. That was the old literary style. And when you're in high school, what do they make you read? They make you read all that stuff. So you grow up thinking that's how you're supposed to write. And then when you try to write something like for real, then people are like, why are you using passive voice? Why are you using this? Why are you using that? I'm like, you've drilled it into my head for the last 12 years. Like, why wouldn't I? You know, when I read War and Peace, it is full of adjectives and passive voice. It's constant. And it's just the way the old literary style is. And I personally like it. Um, but it, it can muddy things and make it difficult to read if you're not used to it. For sure. Well, how did you feel about the story? Not the language, but the actual story itself. Well, um, not very good, I'm afraid. It's... It, <laughs> It 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 totally bypassed me. Um, I I haven't read much of this this sort of stuff. It doesn't resonate with me. It doesn't mean anything at all. <laughs> and 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 at the end, I, and I can't believe it. At the end, get off my lawn. <laughs> 
And at the end, it was all a dream. So you think, oh, okay. So, <laughs> but life is a dream. <laughs> no, I, 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 I sort of understood. I understood the idea of of him dreaming up entities, and well, I think I understood it. But, but it was. I just. I don't know. I, I read it. I read it a couple of times because the second time I, I, I thought. Maybe I've missed something. Maybe I, 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 maybe I'm not not trying hard enough. But I mean, it's just, it's How about me. you, Kenechi? Um, it sounded like yeah. you were like more like you had some negatives. You had some things that maybe you did like about it. I f like, I don't know. I feel as if I get like the whole idea of um the us like our perspective. We might have our perspective of having dreams, but then at the same time, we might be being dreamt up by someone else. I get like that was kind of like the main like thread behind the whole story, but I also feel as if it could have been conveyed in a different way. I felt like when I first started reading the story, I kind of had the, the idea that that was what the story was going to be about. Then he went through the whole story, and then he put that at the end, but he didn't really go into much depth. It was just like that one line. He was a dream too, and then it didn't continue from that. So that kind of let me down. And also I feel like <clears throat> the story... We missed like a lot of the juicy bits. Like, it talks about how he dreamt up this son, then the son just disappears, and then we hear about I don't know. I think he like skips, and then we hear about um, these people coming, and then you know he's something about his son has been doing this, and and I kind of feel like we could have heard what the son was doing, or like specifically you know been told, which would have made it more interesting. I feel like that would have been an interesting part of the story, but it wasn't there. So I kind of I don't know. It was I liked it. I kind of liked. The um, the I like the way how it was more understated. It didn't really explicitly say things, but at the same time, I do feel like some of the things that it should have said, it didn't say. So I'm kind of like mixed. I have mixed feelings about the story. Yeah, and and I did kind of un understand the whole the whole sort of dream. I thought I I wondered whether there was sort of God Jesus sort of thing going on with with dreaming up a a son and teaching the son everything that you you think he needs to learn that to learn and the, and then sending him out into the world and and um, so I, I I sort of understood that, but I. Yeah. I'm just trying to defend myself here, so I'll stop. You don't need to defend yourself. That's what this is all about. It's all about just discussing the story. There's no right or wrong. Mm. How about you, Anais? Where do you um, fall on this mess? Well, real quick, revisiting language. I agree with Gerald. Sometimes there was a few too many adjectives, or I had to read a few sentences two or three times before I really understood what he was saying. But there were some moments that I thought were quite clever. I loved Miasmo uh, Jungle. I love clouds of taciturn students when he's in the amphitheater. And he see I love that. And Penumbra of a human body when he's seeing the heart um, yeah. in the later dream. I love that. But yeah, there were some other parts where I'm just like, that sentence went on for five lines. And it's because the translation, because I looked, it, it's down to... It, the translation is so literal, it follows the punctuation. And I think that's kind of the problem, because Spanish can stand really long sentences and go on forever in a way that I think English can't. Um, but now moving to the story, I think part of the reason why it resonated so much for me is because I saw a lot of what he was doing as kind of analogous to a writer's process in creating a character or a whole other world. When he's first, it's really funny because when he's looking at the um, the students and he's looking for a student that doesn't always agree with me, but he's dreaming yes. them. I actually <laughs> highlighted that. It was such a great line. After nine or ten nights, he comprehended with some bitterness that he could expect nothing of those students who passively accepted his doctrines, but that he could of those who at times would venture a reasonable contradiction. I love that. And it, it, and it made me think of writers who say that they argue with their characters or their characters do unexpected things. I was like, I get, you know, I understand what he's getting at here. And also when he says how his favorite one, the one boy he chooses, is uh, looks like him but is wilder and smarter and more clever. I'm like, writers do that all the time. So do parents. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Not that we would ever admit to having favorites, but yes. Yeah, and, and the thing is, then he does make his son later when he goes into that painstaking detail. After he sort of has what I guess you could call the writer's block, in this world the dreamer's block, he's unable to dream. Then he starts dreaming about other easier things, and he gets back to it. Then it takes him years just to come up with the body. Then a couple more years just to come up with what's inside, the beliefs, and everything else that goes into his son. And then he has the pride of a parent that I think writers also have when they've created something that is real. 
And then for me, at the end, when he realizes he was also dreamed, that stayed with me also in sort of the writing process as well, because as writers, we're all informed by writers and dreamers before us, stuff that we've read before. So all of a sudden, you start when you go back and you read the thing you wrote, you're like, is this kind of like the Hunger Games? Like, <laughs> you start to realize that there's elements of yourself that came from somebody else's imagination. So I really like that. Yeah. I think the parts that resonated with me the most is um, growing up, I was very much in my own little dream world all the time. And there was a period of time where people were actually concerned because my definition of reality and not reality was very fine. It was a very fine definition. I, In particular, I had an instance where I tried to convince a teacher that it didn't matter that I didn't do my homework because in another realm, another reflection of our reality, I had done my homework. And so that's just where my wow. mind was. Yeah. <laughs> My mind was like way out in left field for a really long time. And and it was because I was doing a lot of reading on um, reality and different concepts of reality, what makes um, something real. And I would read stories and they would feel so real. And then I started wondering, well, how do I know that I'm real? How do I know that I'm not just a story? And so I already was predisposed to having those feelings anyway. And so reading this, all of a sudden, like I'm reading a story that has kind of put into words this very amorphous feeling that I've had like my entire life. And so I definitely resonated with me on that level. It resonated with me on a Buddhist level because we do have this concept of Maya, which is the illusion of reality because what we see and who we are isn't really real. And so I was predisposed in that way. And then also, like you said, as a writer, as a mother, I, I feel like any time you create something, I can see the steps that he's taking in things that I do. So, like, when my kids are growing up and they're, like, so well-behaved or anything, there are times I'm, like, rebel a little bit. This isn't natural. You need to, like, you know, get a backbone and, like, you know... Stand up for yourself a little bit. Don't be so willing to say mommy's right. You know, I know that sounds like totally like weird to say about teenagers, but I do have those feelings because like you want your kid to to have that backbone before you send them out into the world. And then once they're gone, you know, to hear about them second hand like that. Like that's something that I could totally, you know, identify with. And so I was resonating with the story on several levels. And I found that each time I read it, I saw something different, especially when I listened to the audiobook version. It's very, very, very well read. I wish I could remember the reader. The narrator is amazing. And when I listened to it on audiobook, and then I went back and read it again, it was like, wow, like, Every time I read it, I'm seeing something different. And to me, that is the marker of a good story. If I read something once and I really enjoy it, it may not be a great story. Because then the next time I read it, it may be boring. But if I can read something a gazillion times and every time I read it, I see something different, I get more meaning out of it, to me, that is a really good story. And, and because of that, I didn't really mind the language. Like, I get that it was translated, but even if it hadn't been translated so literally, I... Like, I don't mind long, like, meandering sentences. Like, Virginia Woolf is one of my favorite writers. I don't have a problem with that. But at the same time, like, I, I read it differently. Like, the first time I read it, there were portions of it that I had to read aloud because in order to fully understand it, I had to, like, chew on the words almost. Um, and I tend to read those stories slower. And so, yeah, that's just where I'm at. I, I really enjoyed it, but... Like, it, it was work, you know, it was work to enjoy it. And I don't, like, I appreciate when a writer writes a story the way the story needs to be written rather than writing the story the way that they think the reader will accept it easiest. Yeah. Like, I, I, I kind of feel like sometimes writers talk down to me and, and I appreciate a writer that's like, no, this is where it's at. You want to read me? Then you come up to my level. <laughs> you know, I kind of <laughs> like that. <laughs> and, and it challenged me in that way, and I like that. I, th I think it's kind of interesting. You said when you were when you were younger, when you were a child, you were sort of looking at your own existence and and sort of almost almost you know thinking about existentialism and and reality and all that stuff. And and I I remember I. I felt a bit like that at one point, and I thought, "How? Uh, 
what hap what would have happened if I hadn't been born? Would I still be me, but in a different place, in a different body? Would would my mind be you know still exist? And I thought about that for a little while, and then I thought, no, I'm going down the pub. And and <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean to tri I don't mean to trivialise it, but it, it but then I, I I sort of came, you know, this is reality, this is me, and and. So I, I'm sort of grounded in reality, and and I'm I'm working, and I'm I'm trying to enjoy life as it is, as I see it in front of me. So it, it's so it it's that I sort of stopped worrying about anything else. You know, it's it's this is this is reality. What's around me now, and and, and see know, for me, it's about. definitely not like I'm here because I'm curious to see what happens next, not because I necessarily think it's real, and. And so when I'm reading this story, like I, I'm it's not challenging any preconceived notions. It's not giving me like like sometimes there there's a term for this in psychology, and of course I'm tired, so the term is like pff, totally left me. <clears throat> but when you have a set paradigm and then something challenges that paradigm and it upsets you because it's challenging that paradigm, there's a word for that. And I didn't have that because this doesn't challenge my paradigm. Like, I already have those thoughts. But I can see how someone who is really grounded in in reality, reading the story, would be annoying. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it, it's... Yeah, I, I just can't see the point in... I can see. I can see. It, it's it's like my, my my whole sort of um, vision of uh, or my thoughts about um, about religion is, is that I, you know it's it's not for me, but I I can appreciate that other people um, want need like having the faith that they have and the belief that there's something wherever it is and uh, and that there's a life hereafter and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and that's great, and and I think it's a bit like that. It, it's you know, yes, if if that's if that's how you if that's how your life is, and and you sort of thinking about things like this, um, that's great. But I, for, I just can't sort of. It's almost like not letting myself drift off, if you like. I, I'm just sort of, you know, oh, you know, I'll go and make a cup of tea, and and you know, if if I start to think uh, something, you know, something a bit sort of vague. Um, I'm, I almost bring myself back to reality and say, right, you know, this is what you have to do. You know what this reminds me of, Anais? <clears throat> At one point I um, looked up the term magical realism in, online and, and on the wiki page about, I don't know, three quarters of the way down um, it talks about one of the controversies being that um, magical realism is, off, is often applied to other cultures' literature from a Western point of view. So, <clears throat> like, if you read a Christian book, it's not considered magical realism, but if you read a book from South America or a book from Africa that has elements that don't coalesce with the Western point of view, then it's suddenly considered magical realism. And I think what this is reminding me is that, for me, this is real. Like, that's how I see the world. And... When I'm when I'm thinking these thoughts about reality, it's not because I'm like thinking gray thoughts. It's because I'm recognizing what I'm seeing because I'm literally seeing the world differently than Gerald sees the world. And I think that this story is really interesting because it's definitely bringing that to a head where you can really. It's kind of it's like a dividing story. It it tells you where you are on the how you see reality scale. It, it's almost like you're saying it's like a rush rock test in a way because I feel like the story is, um, I don't want to say vague, but it's it's open to such interpretation that you can pull from it a Buddhist interpretation or a more secular one about the writing process or the creation process of any artist, or you can go with the traditional Judeo-Christian belief in creationism. Gerald mentioned the whole, is this a Jesus-God thing? Because you can definitely pull that from oh, this too. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that was all in there. Yeah. So I think it says more about the person reading it in a way. Mm-hmm. Cool from it. Point, yeah. What are you thinking, Kenechi? You're quiet over there. Um, I was just listening to you guys talking about reality, and it made me think of um this movie by um, Richard Linklater, Waking Life, and the mm -hmm. whole film's about this guy that initially he thinks he's he's awake, but then 
he wakes up. And so then he realizes he was dreaming. But then he wakes up again, and he realizes he was still dreaming. So like, throughout the movie, he just keeps waking up. But then, like, within the dream, he meets all these different people. And there's one scene particularly where he's talking to this girl, and she tells him about an idea she has for a game show. And then he just remarks how um, he, says, he says to her, because at this point he knows he's dreaming, he goes, well, obviously I created you, but I didn't come up with that idea. And that's a really good idea. So I thought it was quite... Like, when you were talking about reality and stuff, it just made me think of this film about how, what is reality really? And then um, there's also a point in the movie where, um, I think it was Philip, Philip K. Dick they were talking about, and that he wrote a story, I can't remember the name of it, but in his story, I think he wrote a scene that was like the Book of Acts, and then um, he was relating this story to someone, and someone told him that, oh, that's the Book of Acts. But he was like, he's never read the Book of Acts before. So, um... Somehow, he, like, those, those ideas were in his head, and then he somehow came up with a theory that um, I think that time is an illusion, and that really, like, the time that exists right now is just one time, and, like, we're just imagining we're somewhere else, we're really, like, your whole life is trying to wake up into that one time, so... I kind of went off on a tangent, but this is where my mind started wandering when you started talking about it. I want you to link me that story when we go off air, because that definitely sounds like something I would be interested in. You know, it's interesting that you mention that, because there are certain commonalities that cross all religions and cultures, and definitely the idea of creation and um, being thought or being created out of nothing um, being created out of dirt, like those are really common themes across culture, and uh, and it's interesting that those themes develop independent. They don't. They develop independent of each other. You can like find a tribe that's never been contacted with pe by people, and you'll find commonalities in their mythology to other known mythologies, which I, I definitely find interesting. You know, um, as far as the story. I would say for me, I'll, I'm definitely going to come back to the story. Um, I know that the writer had done a lot of reading previously, and he considered his writing as part of a great conversation that would go on in memorial. And so for me, I feel like in order to fully understand the story, I would definitely need to go on and read a lot of the other texts that he was referring to, um, and, and texts that in turn refer to him because this is a conversation I'm definitely interested in having. Um, I think I, rem I remembered why I started thinking about um, Philip K. Dick was because I wanted to ask what your, because um, you said you didn't think this was real, what your um, definition of reality was because I remembered, I think it was Philip K. Dick that said reality is everything that um, doesn't disappear when you start believing in it. But that's just his definition, so I was wondering what yours was, Maya. My definition of real, mm. this is going to sound really weird. I actually don't have one because I don't believe real exists. I don't think that's weird at all. To be um. honest, when, you, when you, like, if you actually sit down and try and define what real is, it's really hard. Like, you, would, <laughs> you think you know, but then you try and actually go through it and, like, come up with a strange definition, and it's, it's really, really yeah, hard. I, it is really, really hard, you know, and... Part of me wants to think that like this all around me is real, but on the other hand, it to me it is all illusion. You know, matter is atoms, and I don't see any atoms, and they're coming together and they're creating matter, and like this atom is flying off of me and turning into that atom. So what makes it suddenly wall and not me? Like, like it just gets all like weird and crazy in my head, and then I get to a point where it's like you know, like the Buddha said, why does it matter? Like, you know, the old story, like, someone says, is there a God I need to know? Is there a God I, I just need to know? And Buddha says, that's beside the point. And I kind of feel like that about reality. Like, what is reality? It's beside the point. I'm here now, okay? And and I'm just curious about what's going to happen. And it doesn't necessarily feel real. And there are things that happen that don't make sense. And I kind of am just open to it all as experience. That's how I am. How about you? What's your definition of reality? I actually don't have one, to be honest with you, because <laughs> I, I started thinking about it, and then it's your funny because it, it tied... <laughs> 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 yeah, well, it, it ties into the story because I thought, okay, well, let me say that, you know, 
what we traditionally consider reality is real. So when I'm awake and I touch and feel stuff, that's real. But then my thoughts, like the things that I dream, on some level they're real as well because they exist. I dreamt them, so they exist on some level. So like, is that like a lesser level of reality? And then it came to a point where I was like, I can't really say defi- definitively what's real or what's not. I can say there's like different levels. So there's a level where, you know, these are the things that I see and if other people see, they're going to agree with them as well. Whereas there's things that only I see that other people can't see that they, they won't agree with, like my dreams, for example. So I still yeah. don't actually know what the definition of real is. So. Yeah, I, I, I've kind of just said, I've kind of just thought, you know, this, this agreed upon reality is just agreed upon rules that we all agree to live by. I, you know? I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's interesting, just, just what uh, Kenichi said about dreaming and, and, you know, dreams are real. And and I, I, I sometimes have this thing about the the point where you go from dreaming to waking. And sometimes you'll say something in the real world that that was happening in the dream world. So you or, or you might call out or something, or, or you might turn to someone and say, you know, um, uh, rope printers or something. <laughs> And they'll uh, say, what? And you say, rope printers. Like, they're stupid, you know. Rope printers, obviously. And then you think, what? You know, no. So, so yeah, I, I, I've always thought that there's, there's, there's a germ of a story or something in that, in that sort of infinitesimal piece of time that where, where you go from dreaming to, to wakefulness. And, and what is that? You know, where are you? Where are your thoughts before they become grounded? Up. I once woke up pissed off at my boyfriend for cheating on me because I dreamt that he cheated on me. He's like, but you were dreaming. I didn't really cheat on you. I'm like, but you cheated on me in my dreams. I was so mad at him. <laughs> yeah. I've done that, and I've done it both ways. I've done it where I woke up mad at my boyfriend. I woke up saying, dreamy was way nicer. When in the dream, he did something <laughs> yeah. he wouldn't do in a way life. <laughs> um, but it's, it's funny listening to you guys talk about that. Maya, when you were saying, you know, everything, you're like, it's atoms, but I can't see atoms. I just sort of see this wall, but what is that? It makes me think a little bit about um, the holographic principle, which is, this, it's a part of string theory. I don't know much about it, other than it's the idea that a lot of what we see or the universe that we interact with is actually a hologram of actual things beneath it. Mm-hmm. So there might be something there. And, yeah. um and and Gerald was saying that sort of trance-like state between sleeping and waking reminds me of something I learned recently, which is that apparently that's when Einstein would do his best thinking, and he would lie down to take a nap to do some of his deepest thinking. He would hold a stone in his hand and hold it over the edge of the bed so that when he truly fell asleep, he would drop the stone, wake himself up, and enter the trance-like state again. And that's how he arrived at a lot of his theories, which he says he sort of came from the cosmos. He also did a little bit of astral projection and plane walking. He wasn't, he, I mean, for somebody, for a physicist, he did a lot of kind of, I guess you can say, um, kind of mystical things. Not really mystical, but yeah, out well, there. Well, they're mystical until they become scientific. I mean, that's my theory. Until we define it. Every, mm. A lot of science theories originally were considered magic or mystical or just crazy you know, mm-hmm. and so like that, it does not surprise me. We there's a history of scientists that dabbled in a lot of stuff that people are like, mm-hmm. really? They dabbled yeah. in that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of funny, isn't it? I, I I'm a I'm I'm sort of a believer in in multiple space time continuums and multiple you know the multiverse and and multiple realities and and. and Stuff like that, and I, I can sort of you get. You should have talked around. to my teacher in middle school. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did just the other day. <laughs> Space. Um, and, and and you know this this sort of border between uh, between mystical things and and science, I I quite like, and 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 also that that scientists in, in the physicists are are defining things. Because they're not there, and, mm. and 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 you just think, I can see the logic of it. You know, if if this exists, you know, if X exists, then Y must exist to to counteract it or something. But but you're you're defining something by its by its absence, which sort of goes against the you know my grounded in reality laws. That it, it's in, in in one respect, it's um, you know, you you can't do that. If you know, to me, if you can't 
pick something up, then it doesn't exist. It's uh, it's a false reality. <laughs> that's what that's me anyway. <laughs> And I, I, I do wonder. I, I, I do wonder whether it's an age thing as well. Whether, whether as you get older, you, you, you sort of think that there's almost. I don't know. This is the reality as it exists because I haven't got much of it left. So I have to. I have to ground myself and 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 enjoy what's around me and and the the things in life that as I see them. Rather I don't than... know. My mom got more mystical as she got older. Did she? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. When she was younger, she was very much reality grounded, denial, mm -hmm. and type person to the point where she le she grew up Christian. She left the Christian church because it just didn't make any sense to her. And then as she got older, um, she became much more open to mystical experiences. Um, she began reading about various different religions again. And, um, you know, there were experiences that happened that, like, instead of saying, oh, you're imagining things, like, she was just much more open as she got older. So I think it can go both ways. I think most people change in some respect, but it's not always in one direction or another. And I, and I, do, I, do, love, I do love the idea of, of, of your life experiences changing on some semi-abstract Thing. Um, we had a film over here some years ago called Sliding Doors, and it's all about a woman who's late for to catch the tube in London to to get to her job. Oh yeah. And, it, and in one reality, she gets bumped on the way down the stairs and she misses the train, and she goes home and she catches a boyfriend having an affair. Da 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 da. And in the other reality, she doesn't get bumped. She catches the train and she doesn't know that that he's having an affair. And 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 so they they. You know, they really did well. The, these two sort of slightly parallel but diverging lives, um, and 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 you know what her life was like in both of these realities, just on this sort of split second of missing a train or catching a train. I, I quite enjoy that. I quite like that that idea that that the whole of your life experiences can change just on one tiny thing. What other strikes? What else strikes me is just how modern this story feels outside of the language. The mm. thoughts in the story are very, um, they strike me as very modern thoughts as far as, you know, questioning the definition of reality and, you know, dreams and what they mean and creation. Like a lot of these are thoughts that to me feel very current. Um, but then when I do research, I find that, People have been having these same questions and they've been having these same thoughts for eons. They're universal questions in, in many ways and they're questions that a lot of our classic science fiction touches on. Um, they're questions that a lot of our classic movies touch on. Um, you know, and, and in that respect I definitely agree with Jorge that you know this is part of a great conversation that humans have probably been having since we were cave people. I think when, a lot of religions were born of um, seeking answers to those same questions that have been around forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when I was reading this, I definitely had um, questions as far as like instantly thinking about, you know, Jesus and God. And then I'm reading it again, and I'm thinking, well, you know, he's a mystic teacher and a student. And then I'm reading it again, and I'm thinking the Buddha and his students, and I'm thinking of a writer and his and his characters you know there these these questions and these these topics are really universal for me mm -hmm. when when was it written do you know hmm when was it written when was it written in the 40s was it i think so he died he got married in 89 and i think he died like a few years after that so i'm thinking 40s let me look it up like, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. It had to have been the 40s. He was born in 1899. You know what I found interesting reading his biography is he was writing, he was a child prodigy. Mm -hmm. He was writing really advanced stuff at like nine years old. And he comes from a very literary family. And, you know, he grew up in multiple countries. And, and I definitely see all of that reflected in his writing. 
And he was quite controversial when he, when he was younger, wasn't he? A lot of people, probably like me, didn't didn't get his writing, didn't you know, didn't didn't understand it, and and I, I read that he was quite quite criticised in some circles. Well, I mean, back then he he was what a lot of people would consider the beginning of magical realism in literature. Um, until then, magical realism had only been applied to um, like visual arts, and so he he was at the forefront of that. And so it was a it was a new way of reading, and most people were used to white Western literature anyway. And so it was just it was just really really new. But also he was controversial on a political level because when the politics changed, he refused to um, pledge allegiance and somehow managed to survive. <laughs> you know, wow. and so he was controversial in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. But I would love to read more about him. I'm definitely very interested in him. And so thank your mother. Oh, I will. I mean, you just did. She's listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> so, are we ready to start looking at next week's story, or does anyone have any more thoughts? Well, we should give out Bradberries. Yes, we have some Bradberries. Uh-oh. It's okay, Gerald. <laughs> should we just get him out of the way and <laughs> get it over with? Gerald, go ahead. <laughs> so, oh, you get him. A whole two? I was totally. Two. We we're gonna give no. him like zero I, or one. I, I, no, I, I recognize so, some of the I, some of the writing was very good in it. I, I you know the the whole sort of um, yeah, it, so, some of it was very good. It just missed me generally. Mm. Okay. Can, Can I it? Um, three point five. I mean, I think it was good, but at the same time, I just have this. Like, lingering feeling that I don't know like like I wanted more from it like he oh, like he could have given us more but he just didn't if that makes sense so yeah 3.5 3.5 okay I'm giving it a 5 I'm giving it a 5 as well I give it a 5 because I loved it and because there's so much in it that I can read it multiple times and get something new each time and for me it takes an exceptional story to be able to do that yeah I had originally given it in my head a four and a half, and then when I went and I read it in Spanish, and it was so much more lyrical, then I was like, oh, it's the translator's fault. And then I bumped into a five. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to be able to read this in the original language or get a better translation. I think it's something that I would be interested in. Mm -hmm. I think it's. I think translations are quite hard, though, so we have to like kind of be easy on the translator because it's just – I was reading a book recently about translation, and it was how – not a book, but an article, and it was just saying how there's this – like battle between translating it literally or deciding for yourself what you think the author means and then rewriting that in another language. So it's hard like, to find that balance, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just surprised Jorge didn't translate it himself because he spoke English and he wrote stuff in English. And so I'm, you know, I think sometimes mm -hmm. when the author can do their own translation, sometimes it comes out better. Mm -hmm. oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wish he would have yeah. done his own translation. Yeah, I know Murakami has used the same guy for like decades now because he's very yeah. good. Yeah. And Murakami actually does translations, which I find interesting that he doesn't translate his own stuff, but he does other people's translations. I think he yeah. translates into Japanese, though. I don't think he does yeah. the other way around. He does English to Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Should we give okay. um, listeners Bradberries for last week's story? Okay. What did the listeners give last week's story? Just for. Um, for memory's sake, last week's story was The Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin. Oh, no, that was week before. No, that was week before? <laughs> yeah. Oh, meow. Wow, I'm out of it. What was last yeah. week's story? Last week's story? Say it again, Kanachi. The Cheetah's oh, Guide to Love thank by you. Juno It's my Dio. story. How did I forget <laughs> my own story? This is a problem. <laughs> yeah, big problem. <laughs> what What did the listeners give last week's story? 3.6. Ooh, interesting. Mm. People don't like cheaters. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oi, oi. <laughs> oh man, y'all are a mess. 
Okay, <laughs> so for this week's story, why don't you take away how we are going to be selecting this week's story, Anais? I know okay. we had some thoughts as far as who's going to be, like how many stories we're choosing from, etc. Mm -hmm. Yep, so basically to make the choosing game a bit more fun, we're going to have a judge, and the judge will be who, so for example, my story was picked for this week, so I'll be this week's judge, so I'm not in the running for next week, because you don't want back-to-back -back NAE stories. Um, so then it's going to be between Maya, Gerald, and Kanechi. We're going to play a game called Canadian Cities. Real or fake? I'm going to say a Canadian, well, I'm going to say a name, and you're going to tell me if that's really a Canadian city or if that's made up. But before we play that game, you guys should let me know what your stories are. Okay, well, my story is Train by Alice Munro. I want to read a Munro story so bad. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Win. My story is um, not a Murakami story. Um, I'm seeing the 100% perfect go. One beautiful April morning. Ooh, okay. That's a pretty title. Yeah, <laughs> nice title. Maybe that one should win. And Gerald? <laughs> <laughs> That's not pretty to have in, shall we? <laughs> no pressure, Kinesi, no pressure. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can I fold my cards now? Oh, not playing cards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna push again for for Eminence by uh, Caroline Casper, um, which, which is one I did before. But uh, I really would like this one to go through. Okay. okay. Oh, I'm you so bad at geography. <laughs> and these aren't even major cities, so. Hi. Good luck. <laughs> you should get like some kind of like handicap because um, yeah. <laughs> Like we're Europeans and we don't know. Hey, I get a handicap for going through the American school system. <laughs> Good point. I yeah. One semester of geography. One semester. Wow. Okay. Okay. You win. Are we playing one strike you're out or two strikes you're out? Two um, strikes. Yeah. Two strikes. We've got okay. Some time. I'm gonna have here um, a little guide to let me know how many strikes. Keep it honest. Okay. Cam loops. Not a real city. No. You all say no? Yeah. yeah. Sounds like it boots. It is a real city. You, both have one, you all have one strike. But did you pronounce that correctly, though? Because that's that. I, that's not I don't think it's a French one. You would wear in the tundra. <laughs> it's K A M loops. Cam loops. Okay. Oh, this I'll is going to be I'll, hard. We're, nobody's going to have a story next week. No, no <laughs> stories. Oh, you've been Kamloops. Ah, ah Kamloops. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Um, Miramichi. No. No. Yes. It is. So, Ooh. Gerald wins. <laughs> Oh, just like that. That was it. <laughs> Good job, Gerald. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Unless you uh, that was really fast. Man. Man. That was quick. That was like Walking Dead. Black folks just gone. <laughs> what you don't know is Gerald has a map of Canada open in another tab. <laughs> no. no. Who, me? Yeah. <laughs> I would never. No, it, would it would take longer than that to find a place. Okay, Probably. so Gerald, why don't you say the name of the story one last time? Okay, it's called Eminence, and it's by Caroline Casper. Uh, it's a very recent story, 2014. Won, was nominated for a Pushcart Prize and won the 2014 Million Writers Prize. Ooh, exciting! Yeah. Great selection. Yeah. Okay. It's different. Does anyone have anything else to say before we head out? Nope. Okay. Gerald, take it away. Oh, no, I'm going to do the outro script. Right. Okay. Um, sorry. I will be editing that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Uh, okay. Here we go. Uh, for show notes and to join the discussion, visit literaryroadhouse.com. You will also find all of our social media links on the site. While you're at it, like our Facebook page and leave an iTunes review. It helps us a lot. Don't forget to tell your friends until next time. Read a good Read story. Read a good story.